Uh, hey, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. Um, I'm one of your hosts, Lisa, and I'm here today with my uh, guest, Venkat. All right, I'm your other host, and I'm here with uh, my guest, Lisa. <laughs> hey, hey, Venkat. Venkat, so today we're talking about the letter uh, P. Um, do you have a, do you have a snack that you're eating today? Yes, so my snack today is a papad, which oh. in American restaurants is usually called a papadum, but uh, yeah, it's a lentil fritter. Oh, that looks You get it at uh, Indian restaurants. What are you eating? I'm eating snap peas, so they're green mm -hmm. pea looking things. Very tasty. All right. Mm -hmm. That's good. Would you have our snacks? We have our topic. Snack. And today we're going to try and do something um, in between, right? Usually we cover two or three topics and one time we did the rapid fire 20 plus topics. This time we're going to try and do uh, 10, top, 10 minute topics, right? So each topic gets uh, 10 minutes. Yeah, that's right. So All right. We'll do with this. All right. So the Starting first, the timer on the first one. Go. First topic that I have on our list is programming, um, which why do I want to talk about this today? Oh, okay, so because, okay, so the reason that we brought this up is that I was um, telling you that, I, so I, I spend most of my time programming, um, that's my job, um, and I have a, I don't know if I have a friend who says this or if this is something that I kind of think is true, but um, so I, I spent most of this morning working on code, and I'm, now I'm finding it kind of hard to like put thoughts into words. Um, mm -hmm. I actually had a conversation earlier with um, someone in our company who doesn't do programming all the time. And I just kept finding myself sort of talking in circles and uh, train of thought as I was speaking. Um, I, I don't know if that's my brain normally or if that's my brain on code, like on programming. Um, do you, <laughs> I think it's your like, brain normally. Okay. Thanks for I, I, I think we were chatting on um, Messenger before and I said you remind me of the uh, what's her name? Luna Lovegood character on Harry Potter. And um, I think, um, yeah, you strike me <laughs> as going off on like weird tangents all the time anyway. So it might be that you picked your particular style of programming because you're naturally that way. So the causality may go the other way. Uh, but um, I don't know if there's one personality for uh, programmers. Like um, I remember Steve Yagi wrote that article about conservative versus liberal programmers. So um, loosely, it's like people who prefer strongly typed languages that impose a lot of rules and structure on you versus weakly typed uh, languages. So he had a thing about uh, liberal versus conservative programming. And uh, another similar uh, idea I had was uh, from my friend uh, Keith Adams, who was an architect at uh, Facebook and uh, Slack. And he claims that the fox versus hedgehog dichotomy applies to programmers. Uh, so I might be misremembering how he put this, but he classified it as kernel versus compiler programmers. So people who are naturally kernel programmers think a particular way that's kind of more uh, foxy, I think, and people who are more naturally compiler types are more hedgehoggy. So my point is like whatever personality typology you like, there's probably several types of programmers. So uh, uh, you might be, I don't know, more foxy or something. So what's your programming style? You'd have to tell me. So I don't, I'm not sure I get what the fox versus hedgehog analogy is. Uh, so f that refers to the Isaiah Berlin quote that I use often, which is a fox knows many things and a hedgehog knows one big <laughs> thing, right? So you can think of applying that to programming, I think, as um, I have to, I'll have to make something up uh, but something like um, you look at a large sort of programming challenge as a bunch of little challenges and you write a whole bunch of functions and tests and sort of weave them together where the overall picture and architecture that emerges is kind of like bottom up a hundred little things getting tied together. And then there's yes. the other kind of programmer who's like, all right, this is the program. I'm going to like come up with a top down structure and define my data tables very clearly up front, like architect the whole thing out and create this beautiful grand unified program, right? So that mm -hmm. might be one way Fox versus Hedgehog applies. Um, obviously, I haven't done as much programming as you, but going back to my 20 year old, or, no, when was the last time I did any serious programming? That was about 15 years ago at Xerox. 
and it was in MATLAB. And MATLAB, I think, is naturally yeah. sort of a foxy, uh, scatterbrained programming medium. So I would say, to the extent that I'm a programmer at all, I'm a fox programmer. A fox programmer. I have no idea. But I think the problem with me not knowing is like, I don't know what it means to know a big thing in software. Like, so I'm not even sure what a hedgehog looks like at this point. Um, <laughs> I think you answered like, the question. Know. That makes you foxy. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I would say a hedgehoggy program is one that has a lot of, uh, I don't know, like almost uh, mathematically unified um, sort of grand theorizing at the core of it. Like, uh, mm -hmm. have you used uh, Rome research? Um, I haven't, no. no but that has, um, I would say, kind of a hedgehoggy structure. Like uh, Connor, um, who's building it, has very decided opinions that are kind of like holistically aesthetic on how the whole thing should look. And the whole thing clearly is like, a single unified thing. It does not seem like you know, 50 random things glued together. Whereas uh, I've done that kind of like unified holistic looking thing before, but most of the time when I program, it looks like 50 random little things glued together to get something done. I mean, I think it really depends on what kind of stuff you're building. Um, so what are you building right now? Uh, right now I work on a large open source software project that's in it's like a Bitcoin projecty thing. It's a Bitcoin scaling solution protocol project. Um, so, so Bitcoin, I would say, is a hedgehoggy piece of software, like the core Bitcoin thing, right? It's got a bunch yeah. of like pieces that fit together very elegantly in like an overall architecture. But I don't know if that's true of things built around Bitcoin. I don't know, though, man. I like at some point in programming, you can break it all down. It's like, what level do you want to look at it? At some point, all of it is built as like parts cobbled together. Um, like at some point you get down far enough and even the hedgehog thing is like a bunch of pieces. Yeah, it, I, I mean, it, um, like this is like yet another piece of astrology, right? Like Myers-Briggs or something. But I think there's some truth to it. Like uh, part of it, I think, comes down to like programming languages, for example, like uh, mm. uh, to the limited extent I've played with it, like PHP seems like a cobbled together mess to some extent and mm. uh, uh, something like uh, maybe Python, maybe Smalltalk, all those sort of more like um, holistically conceived things seem a lot more, I don't know, integrated. I That's, but uh, what do you mainly program in? Uh, these days I write a lot of C code. Um, okay. And Python, C and Python. I really like Go. Go is another favorite. Um, I think those are, those are kind of middle of the road languages. I think, uh, who was it who said something like, oh yeah, Lisp is, did you ever see that Paul Graham thing where he said uh, the history of programming is taking features out of Lisp and adding it to C, something like that? Uh, I didn't know that. Maybe, I don't know. Yeah. I have a lot of like meta opinions on programming, but I don't program. You program yeah, a lot, but you don't have many meta opinions. I feel like that's because I do it. So like all of my like like whatever opinions I, I've held about programming, I feel like have been washed away. It's like pebbles that like have been in the river for far too long and they're just worn down <laughs> to like the flat riverbed. And it's like, yeah, man, it's just programming, man. I don't know. I don't have like a lot to say about it. My brain, you know, other than the fact that I feel like it eats at my brain, but. Um, <laughs> this might be more a male female thing than like uh, active versus inactive programmer because yeah, I don't program much now. But the friends I'm citing, they program a lot. Like Keith Adams, uh, the guy who came up with that kernel versus compiler thing, he's like one yeah. of the best known programmers in Silicon Valley. So clearly him having meta opinions does not mean he doesn't do hands-on stuff, right? So, um, it, so it might be that, I don't know, this is like stupid male theorizing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe guys have a lot of... Um useless opinions about things. I don't know, like, uh, oh. I'll buy that, sorry. <laughs> like, oh. uh, have we hit our 10 minutes? Are we like over yet? <laughs> no, no, we have a minute 30 left. So you get a minute 30 to theorize or not theorize about programming. Yeah, but let's go back to your original point that you have like programmer headspace and you feel more, I don't know, distracted or scatterbrained when you've been programming for a while. Is that true? I think like, okay. So, I mean, if you think about what 
some amount of like what programming is is like figuring out what needs to be done and then doing it um and then like trying it seeing if that fails going back retrying it but it's like programming is an action like so like i've also been, like i do a lot of i've been working on a lot of like i have a little like projects as well um the actions that programming requires of you are so weirdly close to like the brain space because it's just writing it's like a process like in order to get something to happen in programming land it involves like you typing your fingers and like the real the real like work of programming happens in your head in terms of figuring out where things are and what's happening and like um your ability to write good programs to a large extent um is a direct correspondence to how well you can picture the whole thing in your head um and like you know, debugging is just the the process of discovering what's wrong with your mental model. Um, so would you say it's very close to writing or talking for you or very different? No, they're different. Okay. It's way different because like writing or talking, I feel like writing is more like, I feel like when I'm writing, I'm not always sure like where I'm going to end up. Like part of the process of writing is exploring the idea space and like, like I'll have like, I'll have like kind of this like image idea that I can like see. So like the mental, the mental place that like writing comes from, it's almost this like, like almost like visionary, like sort of part of my brain. I can't explain it. Um, I like have this like idea shape thought feeling that comes out when I write. Um, and as I write, it like sort of reveals itself. Um, but it's rare that I know where I'm gonna end up where I'm writing while I'm writing. Um, programming really works best if you have a good idea of where you're headed before you get started. Um, and it's actually like one of those things where you like, it, if you don't think it all the way through to the end before you start, uh, as a good chance you're gonna have to go back and like change a whole bunch of stuff. Um, all right, so. so we ran out of 10 minutes, but uh, yeah, I do have uh responses to that yeah I, I think i mostly agree with you though there's kind of like an something analogous to you know compiling and also writing and speaking like uh, mm -hmm. but the thing is you get to decide how sloppy you want to let yourself be in writing and speaking like you can kind of let things that don't truly compile kind of pass right whereas you can't really do that with programming like if it fails to compile it fails to compile all right that's our 10 minute mark so what's our next topic our next topic is progressivism. All right, progressivism, 10 minutes, let's go. Um, so, who, so when I say progressivism, what comes to mind? So for me, it's like uh, two things. One is if I want to be like pedantic and scholarly and academic about it, there's a distinction that's important to make between progressivism, which is kind of like 1910s, 1920s, borderline socialism, communism thing, versus progressivism as it's sort of informally sort of uh, conflated in modern US with like liberalism, which I, mm -hmm. I think is like pretty different. But mm -hmm. um, I think increasingly when I think of it, I think of it as like uh, socialism light basically. Okay. Whereas uh, I think 10 years ago when the culture wars weren't that strong, I was kind of sloppy about it. And I was like, yeah, progressivism, liberalism, kind of the same thing which is no longer true at all. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's accurate. Um, who do you, so when you, when it, who would you think is like, a, do you have like a leading light progressive, if that makes sense? Like, uh, so the entire DSA, so Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and her crew, I think they're like um, classic progressives. So uh, I think it's no longer possible in 2020 for anybody to be, like uh, an actual communist and survive in America. There are a few, like uh, Seattle had a city councilor, I think who called herself an actual communist, uh, uh, Shama Savant. But um, I don't think there are many people who can build a career for themselves, calling themselves actual communists. But progressive, yeah, as uh, socialism or communism like, it's possible to hold that position. Yeah, okay. so. I'm going to, I think the progressive, so the, I think, man, I have a lot of stuff to say on this, but the, I think when I think of progressives, I think of Peter Thiel. I think he represents okay. a different form of progressivism. Um, I think you can actually like, 
So I think progressivism is like, there have been a bunch of movements of it. You mentioned the one in the 1920s. That's where like Robert Moses actually came out of that progressive movement. Um, it was also like, uh, I thought that like Progress and Poverty, the book by Henry George was actually the namesake of progressive, that movement of progressivism was like, it's spurred by his book, which started this huge movement. So Henry George's Progress and Poverty became the first progressive movement, um, at least that we know of. Oh, I was not aware of that. Huh. Like whenever uh, I think of Georgism and land value tax, I kind of put that a little bit more on the libertarian side of things. But that kind of uh, squares with what you, like, it's weird to hear Peter Thiel called a progressive. So in the literal English sense of the word progress, yes, he stands for progress, like technological progress and in that English sense. But in sort of the idiomatic political vocabulary sense, I wouldn't call him a progressive at all. He's a reactionary, He's like a pure uh, Catholic monarchist reactionary in a political language sense. But I think this is the point I want to make is that you can go back and you can look at, I think there've been, there've been more progressive movements since the 1920s. So if you can say, okay, like the Henry George's movement was one and it sort of ended or petered out in like the new deal that happened when the FDR was kind of its like centerpiece part or whatever that happened. Um, there's also like the progressive movement that I feel like kind of took place. I want to say in like the seventies or eighties, like a lot of the old school San Francisco city, city people are actually quite conservative um, and anti-tech are part of the, like the progressive party and consider themselves progressives in SF city politics. I think that's like maybe pretty specific to like SF politics. Um, but yeah, they call I think they define it in environmentalist terms, like very specific yeah. 60s, 70s vintage environmentalism as their sort of uh, coming of age moment. But yeah, I think there's, there's something interesting here where yes, on the one hand, you could just dismiss this as a semantic debate of, yeah, there's like different ways people use the word progressive and they don't mean the same thing. But on the other hand, I think there is a genuine sort of uh, battle to claim the concept of progress, right? So mm -hmm. there's the English word progress, which means that you know things are getting better in the future than in the past. And there is a very conscious sort of fight over defining what progress means, what it looks like, and fighting with other people for that term. Oh, and that kind of makes sense that, uh, what's his name, Patrick Collison of Stripe, um, he's the, I think, become one of the leading lights behind the progress studies uh, uh, thing. Uh, are you following that? No, I've never heard of this. What is this? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, we should Google and link this. So this, I think uh, Patrick Collison, the founder of Stripe, and uh, Tyler Cohen, the marginal revolution economist, uh, economist blogger, uh, they mm -hmm. co-authored an Atlantic feature called Progress Studies. So basically the claim was, humanity needs to progress and we need to kind of make it an, you know, an intellectual academic discipline to study what it means to progress. And when I, when I look at that, um, like Tyler Cowan is kind of libertarian um, from like the behavioral economics school. Uh, Patrick is interesting. I think he started off as like classic um, Silicon Valley progressive liberal kind of person in sort of the traditional Silicon California sense, but then he became uh, closer to a Peter Thiel kind of um, notion of progress. So uh, it, it's, it, yeah, there's something interesting going on there. So progress studies as defined by Patrick Collison and his crew, I think is somewhere in between San Francisco progressive in an environmental sense and Peter Thiel progress as in uh, let's make technological progress happen. Yeah, but God, the American impulse for progress has been the driving force between, I would claim, a lot of, like, anti-ethical, like, movement in the sciences. So, like, um, like, this whole, like, how do you call it? The, the belief that, like, humanity must move forward or will move forward or is going to move forward is something that, like, Western nations have been obsessed with, and maybe even, I don't even know about enough about China, but I think like China, I guess, has definitely been more been playing. I feel like the whole like great leap forward was more of a catch up thing than progress for progress's sake. It was more like we as a nation will not be left behind. Um, so the Eastern version, at least the Chinese version, and I could be wrong about this, but Eastern version of impetus towards progress was a, we will catch up to where other nations are because we as a people are great enough to be where these other people are. So it's more of a comparative progress, whereas the Western 
fascination and like progress at any cost or like like I don't even think we have a good idea of what progress means exactly um but it's still like it's still fascinating to me that like it is and I think you can go back and when you look at the um uh it's still so it's still something that drives and creates new political movements progress is like the concept is this generative seed that as the time goes on creates new progressive movements and what each of those progressive movements what their values are is different so if you look at like the progressives from the 1920s versus like the 60s progressives versus like the super modern like semi-socialist adjacent progressives the reason that they're all claiming progress is because like they're all trying to like wear that mantle of moving moving society forward towards this like glorious new future um but oh, the but like so the, the the seed germ is there the only thing that's different is like the mechanics of which they are claiming to um bring progress about like the 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 tool set that they're attempting to use and the um aimed goal of what progress will look like when it finally arrives and how you will know that you have arrived at the progress promised land the promised land of progress has arrived you will know that you, when you see it because of like xyz and so like i think so i think, I think, you, I think you actually answered your own question from like two minutes ago which is uh, is progress a fundamentally western notion and i think you're right it is and yeah. all of it all these sort of various flavors and uh, values and mechanisms they all kind of derive from i think one fundamental root which is um all of western politics is def uh, descended from christianity in one yeah. sense or the other and christianity is a, a a historicist religion it has a founding moment namely the genesis um, myth and then it has a sort of a terminal moment which is judgment day and everybody gets into like you know paradise or hell or whatever so it's got this it's got a beginning to end arc of history whereas most asian mythologies have kind of a circular time mythology like it's not as explicit in chinese time but indian uh, mythology is very specifically the karmic cycle it's like there is no end point it's just endless cycling and the world gets destroyed occasionally and then it restarts right hmm. and if you look at uh, uh, sort of modern flavors of progressivism they all kind of have like secularized christianity as sort of um, a, a discernible subtext like if you look at the alexandria ocasio cortez socialist or communist light version of progress it's like all right the floor on the human condition of how well everybody even the most unfortunate is doing that has been raised to a particular level of like quality and if you look at something like the wig narrative um, which i think is best represented by people like patrick and uh, peter thiel right now that's uh, Uh, more like what's the best that humans can be and let's actually focus on making the best even better so it's like a raise the uh, raise the floor versus raise the ceiling notion mm -hmm. of progress but it's all like it's sort of christian derived in a way all right that's yeah. a 10 minute mark because progress means you're what is progress in some terms it's like movement towards the movement towards paradise on earth like you yeah. know you're making progress where you're making progress towards you're making progress towards paradise like that is the that is the end goal yeah anyways yep Uh, okay, right. so next so up, we solved our, progress. We solved progress. Progressivism. It's <laughs> solved. Um, all right, topic number three. Ten minutes number starts. Three. Probability. Probability. All right. So, uh, oh, and I think in parentheses I had uh, Douglas Adams reference in there. I think I put that in because. Oh, okay. Okay, so because um, one thing. So, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is a probabilistic novel. Um, and I can't remember why I think that. I just know this. Oh, Maybe totally. I can totally explain why. The central feature of a Hitchhiker's Guide is the infinite improbability drive, right? Yeah. The uh, spaceship on which Arthur and um, Ford escape with Zaphod and Trillian, that's the spaceship that Zaphod steals, which is driven by the infinite improbability drive. And that's actually my favorite, favorite piece of design fiction, where it's like, he has this weird... Uh, I forget exactly how it happens, but some scientist feeds the parameters. Okay, I'm going to try and get this right, which is uh, there was some sort of fake scientific result that an infinite uh, improbability drive would be impossible. And this guy thinks that, all right, so there must be a finite probability that it is impossible. And therefore, you feed that 
finite probability back into the equation, and therefore you have the solution for the infinite in probability drive. But anyway, so this is um, a spaceship that's driven by probability, and it sort of shows up as a plot point in several places where in very extremely unlikely ways, things happen, like uh, uh, when Arthur and Ford get tossed out of the Vogon spaceship, the probability of them being rescued is like, of course, astronomical, but hey, the ship shows up and rescues them, right? So that kind of thing happens repeatedly through the novel. And I think, uh, oh, I totally love it. And that's the part I've kind of taken on and uh, it's central to my attempts at space opera as well. Well, I mean, so it's funny if you if you want to draw the connection between what role is the um, probability drive serving in like classic um, literature, like lit crit, you would call it like Deus Ex Machina, right? Like God in the Machine, um, which basically is like the plot device that magically saves the whatever from whatever. And I love that uh, Douglas Adams has like basically renamed it from God in the Machine to the Infinite Probability Machine, right? So he, I think he makes like um, so you can actually make like a really interesting connection here between um, God is probability. So like in one sense, you could say that the statement that Douglas Adams is making is that God is probability um, or that probability is, is God. And that's actually kind of funny because um, for a while I was dating a guy who was really into like, well, more into like online gaming culture than I ever am or have been. And um, one thing that really like the, he calls like the RNG, like the, I can't remember exactly the phrase he was using, but basically like saying like, um, created the God of the RNG or whatever the random number, RNG stands for random number generators. Yeah. So for any like, any computer game, the random number generator is what decides how, what your fate is in that role or like whether or not you get the bonus box or the bonus box has anything good in it is all this like random number generator sort of thing. And so it's kind of interesting that, um, I mean, I think it was like kind of a joking thing, but it definitely was like a paying homage to this like randomness, this generator of randomness that may or may not give you, bless you with a good game or not. Um, Do I think Douglas Adams uses probability and randomness in a more uh, sort of um, subversive way? So it's not just, um, you know, ex machina kind of um, plot device just to make, uh, make it easy to, make narrative leaps that would otherwise be hard. I think he uses it much more subversively to sort of puncture human conceits of um, agency and causation. Like uh, uh, one that I remember was, uh, uh, I think this is in the second book, but there is a, a band called Disaster Area that plays music that's so loud that it destroys entire planets. And typically they play their concerts in orbit away from the actual planet of their venue. And there's this one little vignette where a bunch of environmentalists are complaining that there's all this environmental damage from the concert. And this is like a nuclear explosion and it's fallout. And they're like, you know, being progressive environmentalists, they are like complaining and protesting the concert. But as it happens, uh, uh, in this episode, they played a concert and it triggers some sort of earthquake and through like some random series of events, it turns out to be the best thing that ever happened to the environment. Like it creates the most beautiful climate ever and life flourishes. So, <laughs> I, I love that because that completely punches the conceits of uh, uh, environmentalists in believing that uh, this sort of like straightforward cause and effect relationships where there's in fact like all sorts of like random unexpected consequences. So uh, he does a lot of that. I, there's probably more examples of that um, in the book that are not occurring to me off the top of my head, but uh, I kind of really uh, like how he does that subversion of, um, yeah, so it's kind of a nihilistic use of uh, probability as a plot device. I see. I mean, so, I mean, if you, but in physics, like when you start when you start really getting into like what is reality, a lot of reality is actually probabilistic. I mean, the natural sciences, I wanna say back in the 19, early 1900s, around the time that um, like Einstein, et cetera, were coming up with new things about general relativity and such, like one of the things that really allowed at some point science to move forward was the embracing of probability as a, a method of scientific research. Like, um, 
P hacking. The invention of P hacking actually, like, uh, actually was necessary for science to move forward. And that the reason for that is that we live in a probabilistic like world in which like results aren't necessarily not. I don't want to say not deterministic so much as that like the range of values that you can get back out of an experiment aren't necessarily like singular, but or plural and uh, you need a way of counting the different ways that things might end up um, in order to make progress on on scientific things. In fact, like the book we talked about for cues was that last week. I don't. Yeah. Anyways, um, oh, we haven't talked about something? cues yet. Uh, when we talked about Feynman last week, we mentioned oh, his yeah, book yeah. QED on uh, quantum electrodynamics. Um, that whole book is about probability, like the the in like the movement forward and figuring out how light works at a quantum level is it like 100% probabilistic. You build probabilistic models. And that's like all the quantum computers are is like probabilistic models. It's kind of interesting when you go from like the basic physics level of using probability to like um, things like social science and human agency and free will and things like that. Mm. It, somewhere along the way, the explanatory power of uh, probability and statistics seems to unravel. Like if you're talking about, you know, uh, a single electron in a potential well or any such like closed classical physics system, it's like you can completely describe it using probabilistic models and that truly actually predicts what's uh, happening. But when you get up to like things like, all right, um, what causes the crime wave in New York in the 1990s or something, you end in this morass of was it lead in the pipes or was it uh, Roe versus Wade or you know this three other explanations. Like one recent explanation I heard was, oh, it has something to do with um, computing and video games or something. But it's like still not settled and there's no way you can settle that because I think when you try to apply probability and statistics at like macro scales where you cannot actually bound the system, the metaphysics aren't actually that clear. Like it's not clear, for example, even what notion of probability you should use. Should you use sample probability? Should you use axiomatic probability? Should you use, um, I don't know, Bayesian modeling? So there's like all sorts of different ways to apply probability to macro systems. And it's not clear that any of them are in any strict sense true about the world. So uh, I make a distinction between probability as used in like quantum mechanics and physics, where it is in fact like as, as clear and strong a theory of physics as deterministic models. So like billiard balls physics uh, with no probability in the modeling at all, it's as good as that. But when you get up to like politics and sociology or even like fluid dynamics and things like that, it's no longer clear that um, deterministic and probabilistic explanations are at the same metaphysical level. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, when you get on an airplane, what are the chances of it crashing? Exactly. If you model it like a classical physics system, you can come up with a number, but then somebody like Nassim Taleb will come around and say, hey, you didn't account for the black swan. And even if you account for everything that we know and sort of understand, you still, somebody could come up and say, no, this is still an open system and universe and a wormhole could open up right next to the airplane and suck it in. And there's no way you could have anticipated the probability of that. So in some sense, at that level of analysis, uh, a probability is not explanatory. It's sort of, uh, it, it's something else. It's, it's descriptive more than yeah, because I mean, a probability is a count, right? All that a probability is is a count of the number of different ways that things could go, and then you have a denominator, and then you have like a, the number of times you're trying it, right? So it's like a it's a counting. Probability is counting game, and so you need to be able to count all the different ways that it can end up. But if you don't know what all the different ways that the plane landing ends up, then you don't have any. There's no basis for like you said. There's no count. Yeah. There's no. You don't know what the denominator is. You can't yeah. investigate yeah. every universal, every every way each universe might possibly end up and count them all and see what number you end up crashed in and which number you end up touching down in. Um, you can't do that. It's not possible. So our um, timer ran out, but I do want to add yeah. one more thing and bring it back to Douglas Adams because he actually really got this. Like. Uh, it, it, there's a line in Sherlock Holmes novels which goes something like when you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable must be true. So that assumes the kind of universe you're talking about where there's a strictly finitely enumerable number of options and if you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains must be true. And 
Douglas Adams invented a detective, Dirk Gently. I don't know if you've read the Dirk Gently books, but Dirk Gently likes to say, I don't like to eliminate the impossible. And all the novels are about exactly that kind of weird, uh, what you can call ontological mystery. So I actually read a paper about this that uh, I'll send you a link to, but there's um, an analysis of Dirk Gently novels as ontological mysteries as opposed to epistemological mysteries. So Sherlock Holmes mysteries are applying logic and probability theory within a finite universe of known things. There are no ghosts or monsters or things. So you can make tight assumptions around what is and is not true in that universe. Whereas Douglas Adams, it's like there may be a murder and Dirk Gently may be going and looking at clues at a murder scene, just like Sherlock Holmes, but he's going to admit the possibility that not everything that exists in the universe has been modeled yet. And he'll come up with hypotheses like, uh, the actual murderer here is a ghost from another timeline, right? So whereas Sherlock Holmes would never allow that kind of hypothesis to enter the set. Anyway, so that's Douglas Adams and the ontological probability. All right. What's our uh, next topic? Our next topic is post-rats. Post-rats. Oh, I don't know if I can actually talk for about post-rats for 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I dropped something. Uh, oh. I think like, threats, the, yeah. the thing about, I feel like, so what was it? I saw a while ago, it was a couple of months ago, there was this like Twitter flare up about, I can't remember exactly what the flare up was. I can't remember if it was the difference between post rats and post and ra rationalists. So post rat stands for post rationalists, right? Um, yeah. And I can't remember if the Twitter storm was like post rats and versus rationalists, or it was like, what is a post rat? And it was just this like endless meta circle description of like trying oh, to God, explain yeah. what it, a post rat was. Um, I think I can speak to this a little bit since. Uh... Wait, wait, let me finish. Let me finish my point. Oh, okay. like, really sorry. Let me like. Okay, so but like so so like looking at this, I like looked at how this. Um, I looked at how this like this thing came out, and like it was like oh so post rat the conversation around post rats is like this endless meta vortex that like is a conversation that like can just like anyone at any time can like spew out like what is a post rat and it creates this just like huge whirlpool that like everyone gets sucked into and it's just like there's no escaping it it's just like this like endless thing and so like even attempting to like venture into the deep is like full foolhardy like <laughs> Yeah, and here's my theory of why we are in that condition. So I think as far as I can tell, the term post-rat or post-rationalist post started when um, Scott Alexander made his uh, map of rationality. So this was, I think, in 2013 or something. So he published a map of rationality. And most of it was like the rationalist blogosphere and people in that world and what their blogs and writings were but included what a bunch of us, including Ribbon Farm, uh, that were labeled post-rationalists. So there was me labeled post-rationalist. There was uh, Mike Travers labeled post-rationalist. There were like four or five. Sarah Perry um, was also labeled post-rationalist. So rationalists define post-rationalists. So that's an important thing to remember. It's not that post-rationalists define themselves. It was rationalists who decided that there's this category that exists, which is people who have so th this was the weird thing. It was at once snide. It was at once a snide put down and an aspirational label. So aspirational label, as in once you've matured past um, the rationality, then you become a post-rationalist, like you know, a tachyon past the speed of light. It's the progress. It's the progression. Exactly. Of exactly. Rationalists is uh, like this is the promised land that you can arrive at. <laughs> and on the so, other hand, there was also this. Uh, it was also used as a label for things that rationalists found interesting but didn't quite fit their worldview. And they didn't know what to make of them because it was like, we are not allowed to be interested in this because this is like bullshit magical thinking and why are we reading this? So uh, this is when I first spotted it because I was like, why am I being put on a map and why am I being labeled post-rationalist? I was never anywhere near this. So I think that that's the fundamental tension. It's like, it's both aspirational and um, sort of a heterodox. I wouldn't even call it heterodox. It's, it's sort of like profane. So it's both aspirational and profane at the same time. So it's a profanity against rationalism as well as an aspiration for beyond rationality as a state. And so it started out with a bunch of people randomly being labeled that, then a bunch of rationalists themselves getting sort of disenchanted with the rationalist crowd and sort of seeing themselves as having evolved in some way. 
So that included a bunch of like NRX people and stuff. So by the time I think um, 20, I would say around 2014, 2015, it started sort of actually coalescing around uh, Sarah Perry. So she at some point became the, I would say, patron saint of the post-rationalists. And even though I don't think she ever intended it to get away from her, she was being a troll all the time. She wrote this um, ribbon farm post called, I think, um, Systems of Meaning or something, where she defined it. And she meant that totally as a troll, but everybody took it seriously. And then that became this whole sort of center of gravity of uh, post-rationalist stuff. And it, then it became this whole thing where everybody was arguing about it all the time. And I saw you yawning, and that's actually the correct response. <laughs> you have to yawn at this stuff. <laughs> well, I don't know. I think it's like, I, I like, I like, I like the definition that post-rationalism is the attempt of rationalists to rationalize their like for something that's non-rational. Um, and as long as you put it at like the end of your rationalist digression of like, I will get here eventually, but I'm not here yet, but I can safely ensconce it in like a definition as post-rationalism, then I don't have to like deal with the fact that it doesn't encapsulate into my worldview because my worldview now includes it. Um, I think that's true of only a very small handful of the people who use the term. Uh, yeah. But it's it's more often used, I think, as almost like, you know, a pin on a Google map. It's like a yeah. area or territory where certain conversations happen and the red pin is marked post-rationalist. Nobody yeah. actually cops to identifying with that pin, but a lot of people admit to being in the neighborhood of it somehow. Like take David Chapman. So David Chapman um, uses the term meta-rationality, not post-rationality. So very consciously, he's building this theory of meta-rationality that is, um, in, a, in a sense, a linear progression beyond rationality. So yeah, he loves the Keegan levels of one to five. So he talks a lot about level five thinking and stuff. And a lot of rationalists are kind of in love with that scheme, which is funny because he spends a lot of his time criticizing rationality and AI and things like that. So there's like, yeah, I think post rad is basically an area on the map with a marker. And uh, it's an area, somehow I accidentally got plotted next to it, but uh, I basically, I have nothing to say about it, which is why it amuses me to be like randomly tagged into those conversations on Twitter repeatedly. Yeah, because like, you didn't draw the map. It was rationalists yeah. who drew the map, is my point. It's not that people who like, now that it's been whatever, but like the fact that rationalists felt the need to draw a map and like draw a line around a territory is interesting. Um, what, okay, so if you had to put yourself somewhere on a map, where would you put yourself on a map? Hmm, that, that's a good question. I've, I haven't drawn a map in a while. Uh, I think the last map I drew was in 20, 15 that I updated. Yeah. I, I don't remember what I was next to. So I, I'm all over the map, like literally, like the literal map I made um, in 2015. It has my different projects like Ribbon Farm, Breaking Smart in different parts of the map. So I'm literally all over the map. It's like so, the virtual mansion you were talking about where the rooms are in different places and you have little yeah, portals yeah. that go between oh, them. Oh, totally, so totally. Yeah. I have to steal that idea then. I should redraw the map as a forecaster uh, mansion. But um, I think apart from socially, I don't actually juxtapose anything I think or write about with rationalism at all. Like it just so happens that the same crowd in the Bay Area tends to read both the rationalist stuff and stuff like Ribbon Farm. And I know many of them as like personal friends. But other than that, there's not much overlap between, between the things I'm interested in and the things they are interested in. So I have to be honest, I don't even know I don't think I know anything. Rash I don't. I wouldn't be able. To, I don't know if I can spot a rationalist if I just saw one. If that makes sense, like, I don't really know what rationalists look like. Really? Uh, that's that's a line for the ages. <laughs> but I I know for a fact that you do know a lot of them because we, there are mutuals for both of us on Twitter. So yeah, a lot of them right. are there. Right, but I don't think I would be able to be like, oh, that's a rationalist. Like, I think you need to, you have to like know what the land area looks like that the rationalists like occupy. And I'm not sure that I know what that territory looks like. Or it's like, it's like in order to know what a Polish person is, like when you meet them, you need to like kind of understand what the markers are that make them specifically Polish. And until you actually like meet someone and have them like labeled as Polish to you, like the things that they- I think I can- they, like, turns I can label them. I can label them, it's not hard. So 10 years ago, <laughs> it was whoever was reading Overcoming Bias and Robin Hanson and uh, Elizier Yudkowsky. That was the original uh, crowd that became less wrong. 
but now it's basically anybody who reads um, Scott Alexander. So Slate Star Codex is the core of the rationality crowd right now. And actually a very clear test of who counts as a rationalist emerged like last week. Like, I, I don't know if you saw this uh, thing blow up on Twitter, but somebody posted, I think it was, um, you know, do you follow Eigen Robot? He's a tweeter from uh, uh, Seattle, I think, but he's in the rationality community and he posted something about the New York Times is going to be doing a hit piece on Scott Alexander, everybody sort of uh, uh, locked down or something like that. And there's a big thing over there, but yeah. So anybody who sort of saw that as a threat to themselves, the rumor that there was going to be a hit piece on Scott Alexander in the New York Times. So if you thought, saw that as a threat and did something in response, you're a rationalist. So it's a very clear litmus test. I, yeah, I actually had a comment. I tweeted about that. I thought it was funny. I was like, it's like um, the general hubbub in the deeper internet tribes upon hearing that they were to have a hearing in the, um, the court of uh, the court of record. A court <laughs> the of kingdom of record is going to have a hearing on the deeper internet tribes and they had pushed up like a general hubbub, um, which I feel like is an accurate depiction of what that all is going on. Yeah. So right now, I would say that's the definition of rationality, which is people who read Slate Star Codex. It has nothing to do with rationalism per se as a philosophy. It has to do with a particular community. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, it makes sense. All right, so 325, do we have time for one more? Let's do one more. All Let's right. Let's talk about portents. Portents, okay, go. All right, so a portent, maybe that's not a word people are familiar with. It's kind of like a, a sign of things to come. Um, or like a, like a, I feel like a, back in the old day, they, like, they had a little bit of um, like animalistic portents. Like if you, if a black cat crosses your path, you're going to X, Y, Z will happen. Or if a crow flies, whatever, on your left side for more than three minutes, you will probably not be able to sell all of your whatever market that day. I don't know. Um, so basically there's like signs out in the world that, um, show what is going to happen next. Um, kind of like an indication of what universe you've ended up in and where that might end up. Um, so do you think that you have any, like, what do you, what would you say are like modern portents, Van Cat? Huh. I would love to be more superstitious than I am and sensitive to such things. Huh. Well, like, I feel okay. like the stock right. market. I, I, I have one, I have one, I have one. Uh, you know, all those uh, scooters, e-scooters, Lime bikes, and things like that. Um, when they first started showing up in Seattle a couple of years back, I saw a bunch of them in the water. Like I used to take walks on the waterfront and as one of the pieces of vandalism was people would ride those things and just throw them into the water. So you would see as you walk by the water, scooters in the water. And yeah. that's important of something. I don't know what of, but that's the sort of thing I think of as a modern portent. Okay, so scooters getting tossed in the water is modern portent. I mean, what about the stock market? Do you think the stock market has any like modern portent, 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 portent ability, potential? I, I mean, if you look at particular styles of investing, a lot of it is portents, right? Like um, the Elliott Wave people. So they're like, oh, there is, a, do, uh, have you met any Elliott Wave people? I don't know what that is. So. Oh, so Elliott Wave analysis is this sort of pseudo superstitious way of analyzing stock prices. And they have like a very elaborate theory of like epicycles of like, you know, patterns of peaks and valleys and what they mean. So they do all this. It's not quite technical analysis. It's super oh, wait, these chart people with the charts and the lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that it's one kind of chart person. So it's not technical analysis, but it's a superstitious kind of technical analysis. Yeah, so they have ideas like, like um, this is the, the, the inverted W pattern and it's gone W, yes, W, W. Yes, and there now, you go. We're like on the, the three flying chickens on the wing. And so like, if you do the thing with the right, okay, yeah. The first time I came across that, I think was in the Bitcoin community around the happening or something or like mm -hmm. Bitcoin pricing. And I was like, what is this madness? <laughs> madness. I like, if, you know, when you first see it, you're like, is there something to this? Am I like, is this a thing I should figure out? Cause it seems like they sort of know what they're talking about. And then I was like, no. Um, and actually yeah, showed so. up in like uh I like I have a yeah one of the one of the bank accounts sends me a a letter a newsletter like little magazine on investing, and 
what it's like you know glossy and like big pictures and not really like a lot of technical analysis at all it's fairly worthless but they had at one point they had an article like this elliot style analysis of like let me explain what these like chart movements mean for you <laughs> like going towards a chokehold so you're gonna get a bow tie out of it and you're like what yeah that's exactly it it's um, I, I mean there might be like little bits and pieces that relate to something fundamental but fundamentally it's a kind of apophenia so like seeing patterns where there are none it's as far as i can tell it's the same as looking up at the clouds and saying that cloud looks like a rabbit and it's like yeah it kind of does look like a rabbit but it doesn't actually mean anything that it looks like a rabbit so that, that's kind of how i think of it but uh, uh, i don't know i think there are genuine portents like there are signs that don't immediately have like a logical story around why they're significant but yeah. something in your gut responds and says something that that's significant in some way in some story that i'm not yet aware of um, and, and it's like signs of the plot uh, actually it's it's more often a sign of the current story you believe in going wrong than the new story right so you believe this neat convenient little story of how the world works and then there's these little signs that don't fit so it's like clues that don't fit so that's my favorite kind of portent so like example the e scooters that are tossed in the water right so if there's some like super optimistic um, vc tech person who's like oh, everything is great in the future and the people are really happy to have scooters and they love their new convenience of scooters and getting around then it's like a very literal sign that there's something wrong with that story because if somebody i don't know hates the tech world enough to vandalize scooters by tossing them into the water that means something right so it's that kind of portent yeah. yeah right it's like it's almost like debugging right it's like you see something that shouldn't have happened and you don't know why but it clearly your model of how it should work and how it is working are different because like how it's actually working and how you think it should be working if they did match up the bug wouldn't exist but the fact that the bug exists like a bug is a portent of something being wrong or like i don't know yeah it's a glitch right the connection between a bug and a portent is a glitch of some sort so when you notice a yeah. glitch it's a glitch in the matrix or so the matrix is broken right so yeah i love glitches well then you know it's a matrix right yeah exactly yeah um yeah <laughs> when's the last time you feel like you were visited or had like a portent hmm I don't know. I I don't think I have that kind of like psychic sensor personality. So so know. for me when it, when I notice it it looks like a pretty ordinary kind of clue that I'm paying attention to. Uh when was yours? What was the last thing you noticed as important? I think the album, I mean so like you could be like is that important or is that just so like if you don't fix this that's like clearly going something bad is going to happen. It's like a warning. I guess it's like a warning, right? Um I like, so I have, I own a townhouse as we've discussed um, and there are trees outside of it. And a few, maybe it was like a, m a couple months ago at this point, I am um, like the trees were knocking up against the house and it like woke me up one morning. I couldn't sleep and I had like this bad dream. I had this terrible dream about like my house getting destroyed by like an errant like tree kind of just like <laughs> coming in and like sort of like wrecking the thing. And um we had hurricanes here sometimes not very often but you know high winds are possible and so like i had this like just like or just like horrible feeling that like a storm was going to come through and like knock out my windows and i was going to you know just like break create like a huge mess like a huge wreck um so the last few weeks i've been like very it definitely like it, it spurred me to action like this bad dream of like my house getting wrecked by by stuff Um so I recently I got them trimmed most of them I still want them not trimmed someone that's like not trimmed is probably going to be okay. problem Okay but that one's a little too logical you hear trees thrashing <laughs> against it it gives you a little bit of a dream and then you do something logical like cut down trees I'm I'm <laughs> thinking portents have to be a, it has to be a little more, a bit more magical thinking like you know um mm -hmm. uh, what's uh, what's the thing the groundhog day right groundhog day the groundhog comes up yeah, and it either sees its shadow or not and based on that you assume that there's going to be like four more weeks of uh, winter or not right so that's that's a true portent because there's no meaningful logical connection between a groundhog seeing its shadow and weather patterns that we can actually infer so uh, i i don't know that 
So uh, I would say the, my example of a scooter in the water, that's kind of like that. Like if I use that to infer that there's going to be an economic recession, that could be a proper portent analysis. So it has to be, it has to be a leap of magical thinking. Gotcha. No, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily though. It could just be like foreshadowing, like, you know. Yeah, then it's, then you're just being an intuitive thinker. It's not veering over into like the portentious. Uh, so it's more like, realm. you know, the other day when I was out on a walk, a heron landed on the, the wire above me. And what does that mean? I don't know. Good things are coming. Is that like a, a great sign? Who knows? I, I don't know. But maybe, so at the very least, a portent is an unusual sign that tells you that something is different and something might be changing, right? So it's a very yeah. baseline level. Probabilistically, we've shifted to a different universe kind of uh, deal. Um, I, I'm trying to think of uh, such examples. Oh, but sometimes it's like, it just takes you a minute. Like I mentioned going on walks in Seattle, right? So I, I used to do that very regularly. So I kind of knew what sites to expect, particular ships, planes. Occasionally I'd see a bald eagle. Uh, but mm. one time I saw like a whole bunch of rabbits and I was like, that's odd. I don't normally see rabbits all over the walking trail. Then it hit me that, oh, it's springtime and they're breeding, right? <laughs> it just took me, it took me a second, but, uh, but sometimes you can't connect the thoughts and it remains as like this glitch in the matrix in your head. And later on, it becomes obvious uh, what's happening. Where it fits in the puzzle, yeah. Yeah, or not, or it just turns out to be an actual portent, as in like anytime you see a comet in the sky, the king is going to get assassinated. It could be that there are things vaguely like that. I mean, there's more things in the probabilistic universe than we know. Yeah, it's true. Right, I think that brings it back to the first thing we were talking about. <laughs> it does, yeah. <laughs> All right. So how many topics did we cover? I think six we or seven. Five. Yeah, five. Not bad, not bad. We can shoot for six next time. Yeah. We went over on each of them. All right. Great. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to chat. Always a pleasure, Lisa. Um, see you next week. All right. We'll see you next week. Bye. Scorpio Season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokinscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.